Hey there, welcome to Charting Toward Intimacy, where we're expanding the natural family planning conversation. I'm your host, Ellen Holloway. All right, we are welcoming Becca to the podcast today. Becca, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Awesome. So um, today we are going to be discussing um, some of the ideas and um, kind of thoughts that we have about sex, about intimacy um, when we come into marriage and how that affects our marriage, how that affects our NFP use, um, and just kind of how it affects I, everything really. <laughs> um, but before we jump into that discussion, Becca, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. I live in Nebraska. I actually grew up here, um, moved away for about six years after I got married. My husband was an Air Force pilot. So we lived in Arkansas for four years. And then when he got out of the service, we lived in Austin, Texas for a couple of years. But we've been back in Nebraska for almost six years now. So I am married. Um, I have four kids. I am a nurse. I worked in pediatrics for a number of years. And once we moved back to Nebraska, I got into the gig of teaching Marquette's method of natural family planning. So that lets me be home. We actually homeschool our kids. So that lets me be home with them, but I also also get to kind of keep my nursing brain working just a bit when I work with couples. Oh yeah, definitely. That's awesome. All right. So, um, so some of the ideas that we come into marriage with about sex and intimacy today. So, um, we're just going to kind of start with kind of some of the ideas that we personally came into marriage with. So Becca, I'm going to have you start with just some of, some of those thoughts and ideas that you had coming in. Yeah. Um, So if I were to summarize my views going into marriage about intimacy and about sex, it would be that my worth was based on sex. Um, That manifested in a few, from a few different places. On one hand, there were messages I received from people in the church that said, basically, if you're a virgin, you still have your worth. If you're not, you've given away your worth. And so this totally wrapped up like my entire desirability as a wife and my worth as a wife in virginity in that status about my sexuality then on the opposite side there was society that says your sex appeal your sexual identity your sexual experience is the most important thing about you and then also if I go back to some earlier years um and I talk about this when I speak to engaged couples I was actually abused by a neighbor when I was six so that trauma for me, caused me to associate discomfort or something feeling off with intimacy or with sex because my body learned to associate those at a young age. So I didn't really have like red flags. I didn't, if something was uncomfortable, that didn't trigger my body to be like, this is not normal. You should stop. Mm. So that was just my personal, that was something I brought in. I was also exposed to pornography at a friend's house when I was 10. Um, which is, it's a young age. It's unfortunately even young. The average age anymore is even younger than that. Yeah. And those, that experience and future experiences that were similar taught me like, this is what men want, or this is what sex is supposed to be. And so I had this idea when I went into marriage that it would fix these things, which is a big thing. I always tell couples like marriage doesn't fix something. It's not magic pixie dust. It makes all these (laughs) wounds or trauma or whatever it is, go away. But I, I kind of thought I would, if I found the right guy, if we, you know, we got married in the church, like it was, it was not going to be that hard to figure out. And it would, it would just erase or like put a balm over all the things that had happened. The real icing on the cake was that shortly after I got married, I read a couple different marriage books by Christian authors and they were recommended by kind of mentor And there were some views in these books that I remember one talking about how my temp, my husband would be tempted by other women. And I needed to be okay with him telling me that and sharing that with me. That's just how God made him. And it just perpetuated these lies. And as I worked with couples, I've heard them talk a lot about, and I realized I believed them too, that like all men lust constantly and that God made them visual. So that's just how they are or that men can't control themselves because of how they're made and women can't possibly understand it. And the real clincher was like, if you don't satisfy your husband, whenever he wants, he's going to find somebody else. And so 
I came into marriage with all this stuff and I married a really good man, but there was so much baggage here that I couldn't like freely give because I felt like there were so many conditions. There was so much that was dependent on me doing all of this correctly and in the right way. Or if my marriage like fell apart from that, it was like my fault because I didn't do all this stuff exactly how you're supposed to. Oh my goodness. Wow. Well, Becca, thank you so much for, um, for sharing all of that and for just your openness. Um, I think you and I actually share a couple of similarities, um, in kind of what you were saying right at the beginning, um, in that, like my identity was, was definitely based in sex. Um, and my worth was based in that, but kind of in a little bit different way for me, um, growing up, sex was never talked about ever. Um, I can count on my hand how many times I talked with my mom about it. And it's two, (laughs) um, once in like maybe fifth grade ish, when I kind of had like the sex talk. Right. Mm -hmm. And then once when I was in high school, when my mom shared with me, um, just some personal, um, things about sex that she had experienced and the fact that it was so rarely talked about, um, and that I had basically no idea really even what it was, like how it even worked. Um, I personally perpetuated just such a negativity toward it because the only times it was talked about was that I shouldn't be doing it. Um, and so when I, was preparing for marriage. I actually really remember, um, sitting in, uh, the marriage prep weekend that we had with my fiance, realizing we had talked about sex once. And that was like, right when we first started dating and it was just like, oh yeah, we're not going to do that until marriage. And then it was never spoken about again. Um, and so we're sitting there and we just listened to a talk and now we're sharing with each other. And one of the topics on this um, sharing is about sex and intimacy. And I'm like, I'm really uncomfortable about it. And and I don't even want to talk about it right now because I'm so uncomfortable about it. And all of this, um, when I, I eventually realized this many, many months later, but this resulted in, um, kind of a minor vaginismus, um, for myself. And so sex was terrible and painful and actually impossible for a good couple of months, um, when we first got married until I started actually learning a little bit more about my body and about sexual intimacy and things like that. And actually my journey with NFP is what, um, opened up me understanding better, um, sexual intimacy in marriage and, um, and yeah, and how beautiful it is. So that's, that's a little bit on my story. Um, what, what are some other ideas that people often come into marriage with? Um, and what are some of the things like in our culture that are kind of causing some of these views? I think in general, in the culture, there's this weird dichotomy where like sex is no big deal. So you could have it with anybody, but also sex is like your primary defining factor in It was very, it's very hypocritical that we have such confusing views as a society about sex. Um, People will say like pornography is healthy. That is a common thing that is. Oh my gosh. I feel like I'm hearing that more and more lately. And it's just like killing me inside. Like how, how does that even perpetuate in our culture? It. I think, I mean, it perpetuates because we've gone to a place where we like, we use ourselves, we use people, we, people are a means to an end and porn lets that happen. And then we train our mind to use people if we use that and we don't see our spouse that it really any differently in some cases, like we can't just view a human being as someone I can use in this part of my life without that bleeding over into other parts of our lives where we start to use people again. We can't really compartmentalize the way we think we can. You mentioned how um, your struggles at the beginning of marriage and how learning about it can help because your brain is connected to. Right. The more 
I talk about sex and the more that I like they work together. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Like the more comfortable it becomes, the more you talk about it, the more you learn about it. Um, and, and that's why I think a lot of times on the podcast, I highly encourage communication between spouses because the, if, if sex is really uncomfortable, if intimacy is really uncomfortable, then the more that you discuss together, um, the, the better it's going to become and the more comfortable you're going to become with sex. Wait, I don't know if that sentence was correct, but I think y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. I think the other thing that we hear in society is that, or there's this idea like abstinence is detrimental or having discipline over your sex life is bad, but we encourage discipline everywhere else. We encourage, we support discipline when someone's trying to get an education or if they want to get in shape or if they want to eat well, it's okay to say no to that piece of cake because you're wanting to lose 10 pounds or it's okay to say no to going out with friends because you're going to get up and run in the morning because you're training for a half marathon but it's under an oppressive thumb of a religion versus like, I'm just exerting discipline over this part of my life. Yeah. It's like, it's not, yeah. You're saying like, it's okay to say no when we don't want to gain weight. Like, so we say no to the chocolate cake or whatever, but apparently it's not okay to say no to sex when we don't want to have a baby. (laughs) It's like, what? Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. Because, you know, there's this lie that sex is should be only about pleasure like that's it it, yeah that's its end that's what it is about and so then procreation or the chance of a baby becomes this problem to be solved or to be eliminated because well we should have sex without that which if we just look at naturally how our bodies work that's not what natural law shows us is the fullness of sexuality And I think the other one that I hear a lot, and I even was told this, is that women don't enjoy sex. Like, you're just not going to like it. Oh, yeah. Going into marriage, like, you're not going to like it. It it could hurt it. You know, you don't even really want it. You only want emotional connection, but you need to do this for him. Like, when you're told over and over, you're not going to like something. I I don't, it sets you up with really bad expectations. Exactly. I do remember being told that in college. And so therefore like it, that's why it took me so long to realize I had vaginismus is because I just thought that like, that was actually normal to have like crazy pain during sex. It's not guys, it is not normal for pain to hurt or for sex to hurt. Like, (laughs) yeah. And there's things that can be done about it if it does. So when people don't know it's not normal, then we don't get help for where the problem is. And I think it just comes from so many places. I think there's a side from even the church side with purity culture that can the more toxic purity culture. I think modesty is a virtue and it's good, but when we get to where these teachings are twisted and hurt people, it's because they villainize the female body. They tell men they can't control themselves. It villainizes sex, which is good and holy and powerful. And it just makes it something that hurts people. And then on the other side, you have society, you have media, social media, pornography and its effect on everything because it's everywhere it's in books it's in movies it's tell it's making us think like I'm supposed to like this kind of thing or I'm supposed to act this way um and then kind of like with my story you can have pain abuse trauma that can cause weight we can cause us to view sex in a certain way or we develop coping skills or defense mechanisms that your Mm -hmm. body just creates because you've been traumatized And because of all of these different things and everyone's different story, we also just, we don't have a good grasp on healthy, holy sex anymore. So I think the cycle continues when you have, when all the generation before us didn't have a good handle on it, they couldn't pass it on to us. And now we've got even more issues with how the internet boomed and we have things that like porn that people have been able to access from a young age. Um, You know, I spoke to high school seniors once. And when when I told him, you know, the average age is eight, which means there's people in this room who've been potentially like exposed and using porn for the last 10 years. And they haven't even left, like haven't graduated high school yet. That's crazy. Um, And so when we have cycles like that, and we don't have a good example in our society and in our culture, and we don't talk about it well, we don't have couples who get up and really share like what 
healthy, holy, happy sex life is like. No one has a good picture. We're like, okay, we know what we have is it good, but like, where do we go? Right. And, and it's like, it, it's become so awkward in our culture to talk about sex. Like we don't, because of that, because we don't have examples of good, healthy, holy sex lives that it's just like, it's so taboo to talk about it. So it's like, is a church really going to sponsor like a talk on good, holy, happy sex? I don't know. Maybe I could convince my pastor to let me do that. Probably not. <laughs> it might be a little too PG 13 R rated for them, unfortunately, because it shouldn't be. Ugh. Right. Right. Oh my gosh. All right. So, wow. That was, that was awesome. So many different views. I mean, not awesome, unfortunately, but, um, <laughs> thank you for such a thorough list. Your list was awesome. Um, of just like some of the ideas that we come into marriage with and you guys listening, um, you might've heard something that Becca said and you're like, yes, that's what I'm struggling with. Or that's what I came into marriage with and I'm still struggling with it. Or that's something that I've overcome. Um, so taking all of those views that, um, you just listed, how do these kind of things affect our use of NFP or flip side how does NFP use affect these views? I think there's kind of, I think those are the same question backwards, but like they actually are very, two very different questions. Absolutely. Um, so I tell people NFP is a crucible. It will bring out whatever's there. If the issues are there, it brings it out because there is so much sex. The marital act is so intimate it's, you know, we are being fully known and seen by another person that those things just can't hide and for very long. And when you're doing NFB, you've removed anything that really helps them hide things yeah. like selfishness or insecurity or whatever it may be. So it brings it out and then it's up to you to deal with them. It doesn't fix it. I don't think NFB fixes all, anything, but it will bring it to your attention and mm-hmm. then you can forward with it. If we don't move forward with it, it makes NFP very, very hard to practice um, because some of those issues that can come up just can't coexist with NFP in a way that's harmonious, um, sure. one of them to give. And I will say, like going back to NFP being a crucible, I've been on the pill before. Um, even when I was early married, I was on the pill. And I will say that that shielded us from having to deal with some behaviors, views, beliefs. I won't say the pill caused those things. It might in some people, but for us, it was more that it made it easier for those toxic ideas to just thrive because I think a lot of it's really rooted in love versus use. So Thomas Aquinas tells us love is to will the good of another. Jesus is the best example of love on the cross. You know, gave his life. Use, John Paul II told us love or the opposite of love is use. Mm -hmm. So if Love says, I want what's best for you. You says, I want what I want. You're a means for me to get that. And a lot of the twisted things or misconceptions we can bring in to marriage about sex is because we either think we can use our spouse or we think our spouse is allowed to use us. Mm -hmm. And NFP doesn't jive with that because it's naturally, if you're trying to avoid pregnancy, it is inherently sacrificial and you're denying yourself, right? So you're not, <laughs> if, you, if you're planning to use your spouse, but you have to say no to yourself, like something's going to give eventually, you're going to get really resentful at NFP and you're going to have to explore why, or you're going to end up breaking the rules a lot. Um, and then you kind of also have to ask yourself why. So they just <laughs> can't sit together for very long without a lot of agitation and one of yeah. them to be addressed. You know, I really appreciate, uh, one of the things you said about like NFP doesn't fix these things. Like, I really like this, um, image of NFP being a crucible that it really, it brings these things to the surface and it makes us like see them for, you know, in all their shining, well, not shining in their ugly glory. Um, like, but, but NFP does not fix anything. If you're telling people that please stop telling people that. Right. <laughs> Just like marriage doesn't fix anything. 
you know, there's grace that comes with marriage, but we still have to work on stuff. And NFP, I tell couples when they're engaged and I'm teaching them, I said, NFP will put a doorway in your marriage where if you walk through that door and you do it with an open heart and you really are putting effort in, like you're going to have an opportunity through this door to practice denying yourself and, you know, growing in authentic love for your spouse and having some of that selfishness kind of scraped away because we all have it. Yeah. And there's these opportunities, but it's a doorway you walk through and it's your choice. You know oh, what you're fabulous. doing. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Do you have any other thoughts on those questions? No. All right. So here's the big one. <laughs> so how can we start to kind of recalibrate our views of sex and intimacy in order to strengthen our marriage, in order to get closer to God, in order to have better sex. Um, and I don't know, in order to do a lot of other things. Right. I think the, the first step is always take it to Jesus, pray about it because everyone's path forward will be different. So I have ideas, I have some resources, but everybody has a different journey that they'll have to go down based on whatever their experience is and what their story has been. So praying about it when you first start and through the process is key to know where to go and to have that truth. You know, a lot of these things, they're either pain that needs to be healed or sometimes they're lies that need to be brought into the light and have the truth spoken. And Jesus is the truth. And so bringing it to him and being able to identify those lies, um, if they're lies or whatever it is, whatever's happened so that we can move forward with it and ha- and speak truth or seeking out resources that can teach us what the truth is so that we can change that narrative in our head or change our understanding and how we think about it. Sometimes that means we need things like therapy. Like if there's abuse and trauma, we might not even be able to name some of it yet because it gets so buried under all Mm. the years of what we've built up to help ourselves cope with it. So we have to kind of get those things cleared out first. And that can be individual therapy or couples therapy, but sometimes that's needed for people, especially when there's been abuse or trauma or something like that. Um, Spiritual direction can be really helpful because it's so confusing right now to navigate sexuality in our society. So Mm -hmm. having a good spiritual guide or someone you know who has their feet really firmly rooted in the faith who can help us understand some of this um and sometimes there's even a component depending on what someone's been through of like those deliverance ministries or things we have one in our diocese yeah. not just from our diocese but unbound is really big in our diocese and oh, yeah. so people who help with that because there can be spiritual components you know, we're body and spirit. So we have our emotional side, our mental health side, but we can also have, depending on what's happened to us, some of these attachments with sex that we have to kind of help be broken. Um, And then really just flooding ourselves with truth. So more prayer, but also resources that remind us that sex is good. It's holy. It's powerful. When I talk to the high school kids, I tell them like sex is like a fire. Um, my husband's from Colorado. So we go out and we'll go skiing and they have these big ski lodges and the fire will be like multiple. I mean, these lodges or the fireplaces can go up multiple stories and they're huge. There's these huge, beautiful fires and they give you warmth. And if you're camping, the fire can give you food and it can be romantic. It gives us heat when it's cold. Like there's all these things fire can do, but we know if we don't have a boundary around fire, it will scorch everything. It will destroy what yes. is around it. But when it's in a fireplace, it does exactly what we need it to do. And sex is similar. Like it's, we need boundaries around it because it's so powerful. It can create an eternal soul and a new eternal being. Like it is so good, but we have to have boundaries around it or it will burn things down. Like it can right. destroy people's lives. Um, you know, and really getting comfortable with an understanding that idea of love versus use, because if people could go through many of their relationships thinking to themselves, am I loving this person or am I using this person? I think we could have much happier, holier marriages real fast. If we kind of filtered a lot of things through that, because yes. it's so easy to think, even for me, I'll be like, oh, good. My husband's home. He can, he's finally home. He can just take all the kids and I can go do this. And it's like, wait, wait, wait. Am I like 
using him to like give me a break I mean he's happy to do it but like what's my motive here yeah have I communicated with him um and just remembering that yeah the goal in all this is to have a strong healthy intimate enjoyable sex life and just intimacy both with God and your spouse um as far as like a list of resources, I think it is important to rewrite some of the narratives we've told ourselves, which means finding good books or things to listen to or read. Theology of the body is my kind of go-to for people because I think it is so, it's rooted in so much truth. And I really think it came into the world at a time where it feels very divinely inspired because it happened about the time of the sexual revolution. Yeah. Um, And it doesn't go so far to one side as to get into that territory of like villainizing sex or women's bodies. It's very good and holy. Um, You can read directly John Paul II stuff. Like you can get a book and read the OG version that he put out. It is a lot. It's, it's like (laughs) textbooks. It's huge. (laughs) But if that's your style, like, you know, or if you, you've kind of been exposed to it and you want to dig in, like it's available um, yeah. Christopher West has really good content that is for a beginner level. Mm-hmm. He has a book he's even written specifically for Protestants who kind of struggle with maybe some of the like Catholic language that we'll use in different things. And so he uses a lot of biblical references to support it rather than sticking to as much like tradition side. He goes to a lot more scripture for them. And that book is called Our Bodies Tell God's Story. Um, but he has other books. He has theology of the body for beginners. And I think a lot of people really, when they read that, are like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. Like find yeah. something that that feels right. Um another Dr. one. Oh, I was just gonna say another great book by Christopher West is um Good News About Sex and Marriage. Um, yes, that yes. one's like written in a question and answer style. So there's just like all these yes. different questions, really common questions about sex and intimacy. Um, and then he has just some really fabulous answers, um, grounded in both the theology of the body, um, and the Bible. So that one's also, yes. and by the way, I'm going to link all of these books that Becca and I are mentioning and, and all of these resources, they're all going to be linked in the show notes. So don't feel like you have to frantically be taking notes here, <laughs> but you can just Google Christopher West books on yeah. and start like just adding pretty much anything <laughs> written by him. Like just go for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have a lot of clients and friends who like Dr. Popchek's book, Holy sex. Oh, I haven't I read it, one. Um, but I have heard good things about it. And Sheila Gregory is another person who she's not Catholic, but she, um, she has a blog called to love, honor and vacuum. And she has a podcast (laughs) called, I believe it's called the Bear Marriage Podcast. She's really um, pushing forward with a lot of speed at breaking down some of those really toxic teachings about Christian marriage. That just those ideas that like all men lust, women should always be available for their husbands or they're going to stray, that kind of stuff. She's really from a, she's an evangelical woman, really combating that within like the protestant side of christianity Very and cool. so um she's got some really really good stuff we don't see eye to eye on everything obviously like i teach nft and have strong views on contraception but that's okay i will take it where we have like similar views and she's got really good stuff and i think talks about it in a vulnerable way that a lot of people feel heard and then like you said too good communication with your spouse just always coming back to it a lot of this started for me talking about this when I walked into my husband's office one day, he was working for Palm, And I was like, wait, so do like not all men lust like all the time. <laughs> and he just looks up from his computer and he was like, I'm working on concrete specifications right now. Like, no, there's no lusting. <laughs> I am not <laughs> lusting <laughs> over anybody right now. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I sat there and I was like, I didn't know I believed this. Like, but I think I did. Like something told me I believe this and I did. And, and he was kind of as shocked as I was like, (laughs) oh, okay. Well, I'm glad now that we're 11 years in on marriage and we've been like, we thought things were really good that we figured out this was kind of just deep seated down in there somewhere, but it was so important to pull out because you can't freely give yourself 
when you feel like there's this piece that's like, well, if I say no, what's he going to do? Like, you can't fully say yes if you feel like there's this obligatory component. And that's not yeah. just like, you know, I want to do something loving with my spouse and for my spouse, even if I'm not like totally in the mood. But like, you know, when you feel like there's this almost, I don't want to say threat, that's a little too hard of a word, but like there's this voice in your mind that's like, well, what's going to happen if you say no? Like, then you can't fully be like, yes, you know, it's right. Yeah. And so that good communication and just talking about what it is that has come up um, and knowing that it takes time and being patient, because if you've thought this for years and years, decades, some people it's 10 or 20 years before they realize it, you can't undo that overnight. It takes persistence and it takes time and patience. I mean, I guess Jesus can snap his fingers and heal anybody. So I won't say he couldn't, but like for most of us, we have to work at it and continue to stay diligent in praying and doing this work and reading the books and remembering the truth and talking about it and just doing this over and over until we make, as we see progress. Definitely. And I, yeah, I just want to reiterate, um, the, the fact of that talking about these things more and reading about them and just filling your mind and filling filling your world basically with these positive views of sex and these truths about sex, um, can really, really help. And so, yeah, having that communication, reading books, reading good blogs, um, you know, listening to podcasts, things like that, um, are just so incredibly helpful, um, when you're dealing with some of these, um, difficult ideas coming into marriage and, and some of these, uh, ideas that have been just perpetuated by, um, either side of the spectrum on kind of the purity culture side. And then the side that's like, Oh, you know, have sex all the time with anybody. And, um, yeah, talking, talking about it is huge, but just filling, filling your world with it, um, with, with good, with the good, not (laughs) not the bad, right. (laughs) Don't want to say that wrong. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Becca, this has been such a fabulous conversation. Thank you so much for bringing, um, so many great ideas, um, to the podcast. I hope all of you listening, um, if some of these things resonated with you, if, uh, some of the ideas coming into marriage that she mentioned were something that you had, I hope that, um, some of the ideas that we just now mentioned, um, about kind of recalibrating your thought process around that will help you. Um, and again, I'm going to put, uh, links to those books and blogs and things that Becca mentioned in the, um, show notes. And I will probably put a couple of additional links of some things that we haven't, uh, mentioned, um, if they come up before I put this podcast out. (laughs) Um, Becca, before we close out, was there anything else that you wanted to mention? I don't think so. Just thank you so much for having me and for this conversation. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for listening. Um, again, links to those books that we talked about in the episode are going to be in the show notes. Um, and as always, if you have any questions or comments or uh, just want to chat, please feel free to reach out to me on Instagram or um, email me at chartingtowardintimacy at gmail.com. Links to those are in the show notes as well. Um, This is going to be my last episode uh, for the year. Um, And Charting Toward Intimacy is going to be taking about a six-week break. um, And we'll be back in February with new episodes, um, as well as a couple of super special announcements. So I'm really excited um, for a couple of changes that we're going to be making to the podcast um, and someone I might be introducing you to uh, for the podcast. So be sure to follow Charting Toward Intimacy on Instagram to um, have the updates for all of those things, as well as uh, when the first episode of 2022 will be launching. Until next time.